Well, th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I I'm trying without a mic. Is, is, that, um, is that OK? Yeah, because the problem is I, I, I was given two microphones as I, as I arrived here, one, one for the video recording and the other for, for the speakers. Then I figured that now two is a little, one too many, right? So, so, so if it's, let me know and I'll, I'll put on, on, on the mic. Um, well, well, good afternoon to all of you and, and, and thanks for, for stopping by. Um, uh, as, as Martin said, uh, I'll talk a little bit about refugees and, and refugee migration. Um, I'll talk about refugees in the labor market. And right now, there's, there's, there's a flurry of research uh, looking at how refugees integrate into labor markets, particularly around in, in Europe. Um, but I'd also like to talk about how refugees integrate or do not integrate into the political uh, life uh, in the host country. So, so doing so, I will talk a lot about Norway for two reasons. Uh, one is that Norway has a history of hosting, welcoming refugees, starting in the 70s and, and running through, through today. Uh, more than, than a lot of other uh, European uh, countries. So, so, so there is, at least relative to the population, there's a, there's a sizable refugee population that we can study. The, the second reason is, of course, that this is what I do my work on. So, so, so what I know about refugees is primarily from my own studies, uh, which, as Martin said, uh, involves registered data from Norway. So I'm in a very fortunate situation in Norway where we have access two population registers and we could link all sorts of other registers to that, uh, those data and, and for that reason we could follow individuals through the integration process uh, which, which adds something to, to, to the uh, international uh, evidence on this. So uh, I've, I've decided that it's, this isn't totally relevant for, for, for my talk but it's still a good piece of motivation. Uh, for talking about refugees, uh, the refugee crisis of yesterday. It was only yesterday, but, but somehow it feels, feels like it's a long, a long time ago. 2015, we probably all remember uh, the, the influx or the surge in asylum applicants entering the EU, uh, driven uh, by primarily by um, those displaced by the Syrian civil war and, and the collapse of, of the, or the opening rather, of the, the Balkan route. And, and you probably remember uh, uh, some of the, the, the pictures in the media of, of, the, of, of the large groups of, of, of refugees that were on foot walking through, through the Balkans. Uh, so, so I'm saying that this is not particularly relevant to, to, to my story, to my data, in part because if you remember this picture over here, Norway is located very far up, up here. It's, it's a long ways from the Balkans, particularly if you're on foot, to, to, to get all the way up here. Uh, some did, and, and it was a curious uh, incident, so to speak, in, in the northern region. There was a new route for refugees to enter uh, Western Europe that was called the Arctic Route. So, so you had primarily Syrians, but also Iraqis, uh, finding their way up to a small town called Nikol in, in northern, in Murmansk in, in Russia. And from there, they, they entered uh, Norway through a, a small border crossing in, in the very, very far north. And you can see from these pictures over here, uh, entering, entering Norway. So, so the curious thing about that route is that you're not, and, and, and this Russian authorities are very strict on this, you're not allowed to be out on those roads without a vehicle. So you can't be there on foot. So, so some entrepreneurial uh, uh, individuals in Nickel started selling refugees some pretty crappy bikes that weren't really rideable, uh, but at least they were on bikes. And you can see it's, it's, you know, conditions are not really good for, for, for fleeing <laughs> war and conflict. So this is how, how a large group of refugees entered, entered Norway. Uh, so, so for two reasons, there, there, there weren't that many of them entering Norway during that conflict, which is why I'm saying that it's not 
so uh, relevant for my talk, but still a good motivation. You can see that the, the countries that, that receive an awful lot of these asylum applications are Germany and Sweden and, and Hungary, for, for reasons that you probably know, uh, but, but relatively fewer in Norway. But relative to the population size, Norway is colored here uh, similar to, to some of the other. So it's only Hungary, Germany, and Sweden that, that relative to its population received more uh, asylum application during that period. So to put this in a little bit in perspective in, in Norway, um, let me show you a chart of inflows of immigrants. So these aren't asylum applicants. These are in the green area over here. These are refugees. So, so you become a refugee immigrant the day you're admitted to the country. Right? So, so one thing is, is applying for asylum, another thing is being admitted. And typically that admission happens the next year or something after the asylum application. It happened a little bit, a little bit faster for, for the Syrians that came in 2015. And you can see from the chart over here that in 2016, there's a real spike in refugee immigration to Norway. So this is just headcounts of, well, it turns out all immigrants, so an immigrant by, by, by these statistics, it's a foreign-born individual with two foreign-born uh, parents uh, entering the Norway or, or entering the population register of Norway for the first time. That's, that's an immigrant here. So you can see that, that, that since 1990 through, through 2018, which is when the series stops, you know, something important happened to immigration to Norway, and, and particularly the most important thing was that that you had a huge, huge uh, increase in, in inflow of immigrants uh, around, yeah, well, starting 2005, really, and then going through 2011, 2012. And, and, and that inflow is, is driven foremost by what I've colored here in, in light gray, uh, immigration from the new EU member states uh, following the 2004 uh, 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 extension of, of the European Union in, in 2007, and I think I may have Karasha in here as well. So, so, so. Um, but um, uh, back to, to the asylum, the asylum or, or the refugee immigrants, you could see there are some spikes in the, in the early 90s, and so the Balkan Wars, and also a lot of Iraqis arriving there. Uh, you have a spike again in the late uh, 1990s, again from the Balkans. Uh, but also a lot of Iraqis and Somalis. And then it's a steady, steady inflow of, and we're talking East Africa and we're talking uh, uh, Western Asia, uh, and also uh, quite a few from Myanmar arriving during that, that period. Um, same picture, I've just split up by gender and I, I, um, I uh, simplified things a little bit by, by uh, doing slightly fewer categories than I did in the previous slide. Uh, you could, the, the main point to get out of here is that refugee immigrants and uh, primarily work-driven uh, immigration from Eastern Europe is, is dominated by males. There's more males in those inflows than, than females, um, while family immigrants very often are, are female. Um, so, so these developments have, have totally changed the composition of the Norwegian population. So here I'm looking at immigrants as a share of the population. And back in 1990 or January 1st, 1991, you see that immigrants made up less than 5% of the population, 5% for men and 4% for women. And, and those numbers have, have risen to more than 20% for men, and, or for males rather, and, and almost 19% so for women. So, so during a time span of, of, what is that, 19 years, we've had immigrant share of population going from 5% to 20%. That's, that's huge, that's a huge number. Uh, uh, so, so, and, and a very, with a very, very rapid increase. You see that that increase comes from, from all, all categories of immigrants by this chart, but, but refugee population being, being a, a important gradient here. 
so uh, to the labor market integration, or the topic of labor market integration, how am I doing on, on voice, by the way? Do you, do you hear me okay? Does it echo? No? Okay. Um, so so I'm, I'm, as an economist, I'm, I'm from a tradition where we, we, we hail migration for, for, for the benefits or for the efficiency gains that benefits or that, that you get from, from migration. So, so when we see people movement from a low wage area to a high wage area, this is good, right? Because that means that we're moving resources from areas where they're potentially less productive to areas where they're more productive. So, so we, we get more, more out of it. Uh, but at the same time, we know from a lot of European countries in particular that the refugee immigrant population and, and other immigrants from, from low, the more low income regions of the world, they, they don't do all that well in the labor market. And, and the concern may be that this is gonna lead to some, some long run uh, uh, adverse consequences for, of economic inequality that runs along ethnic lines. Um, so, so looking first now at the, the international evidence on this. So, so from the US, there's a, there's a stylized uh, fact, sort of, that, that refugee immigrants do well. They, they assimilate, as they say over there, very fast into the labor market. They have integration rates that are higher than those of other immigrants. Uh, and those who have studied this thing, like Borges and Cortes, uh, they typically point to the fact that, that refugee immigrants have a much longer time horizon than other immigrants, say labor immigrants, and for that reason they have a greater incentive to invest in human capital, to invest in language skills, to invest in, in other local uh, human capitals. Um, and for that reason overtake other immigrants uh, over the, the long haul as far as labor market outcomes. The European evidence is a little bit less optimistic possibly on this. Uh, so, so up until about the time of this lecture, there wasn't that much data on refugee immigrants in, in Europe. But as I said, the flurry of, of, of research that's coming from Germany, coming from the UK, coming from, from the Netherlands, coming from other countries right now, will, will sort of change change what I'm saying right now quite a bit in, in the, during the next year or so. But, but if we go to, say, the, the European Labor Force Survey in, in 2014, we'll see that refugee immigrants on average in those survey data do a little bit worse as far as employment than other immigrants. So, so slightly less, like five percentage point lower employment rates than, than other immigrants from, from outside of the EU. Um, so curiously enough, Norway is, is here, and it's very much on, on par with what the average is across the European Union. Uh, the Czech Republic is not in this picture uh, slide for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe they're, are they not represented in the uh, European Labor Force Survey, Martin? Do you know? Can you think of any yeah, good reason? Hmm? So is that why? Is that why? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so so if I if I were to look this way, I'll, I'll notice that in Sweden, uh, refugee immigrants do a little bit better in the labor market in Norway, slightly so. But if I look this way, I'll find another another neighboring country, Finland, where they do much worse. So so Norway is sort of average in Europe. Um, but that's a, a pure average cross-sectional picture. It, it turns out that if you look at this picture by year since arrival, so if you look at how it's in refugee in integration into the labor market that I want to talk about, uh, then you'll see that the, the difference between refugee immigrants and others sort of seems to disappear over time with time in the country. So this is a, a picture that I, I lifted from a, a paper by, by Christian Dustman et al. And, and it shows here how refugee immigrants and other immigrants do relative to similar natives, depending on how long they've been in the country. So, so when we look at, at this 
spot over here we're, we're talking about, or the, the marker over here, we're talking about two years after arrival, then we find that refugee immigrants are, have a, an employment differential of about 50 percentage points. That's huge, that's a huge number. 50 percentage points below natives, that's the, the red line at zero, uh, natives of the same age and with a similar educational attainment and of the same gender is what they control for over here and, and living in the same host country. That difference shrinks rapidly. So at five years, it stands at a little bit more than 30 percentage points. At 10 years, it sits there at 25 percentage points. And apparently at 15 years, it's, it's shrunk to less than, than 10 percentage points. And what the picture over here suggests is that refugee immigrants eventually uh, assimilate into or integrate into the labor market and, and catch up with, with other uh, uh, migrant groups, much like the, the, the stylized picture from the US. But it's, it's a little bit, you know, this, that's a cross-sectional picture and you always get a little bit concerned with those cross-sectional pictures because one thing, there's, there's, there's a lot of heterogeneity in these various uh, scatter points. So for instance, this is from 2008, so it's a little bit old by now, but, but, but still it's, it was a nice picture, so I wanted to use it. Uh, if, if you think back to 2008 and think of who, who had been in Europe uh, or who had been in, in these countries, uh, Western Europe, for, for 15 years, well, they were by and large from, from the Balkans, from Bosnia, most of them, right? And if you think of who had been in Europe for, for only two years, well, they were Iraqis and Somalis. So, so there's a danger over here of, of sort of looking at a recently arrived Iraqi and a well-integrated Bosnian and then using the Bosnian as a projection of how the Iraqi is going to do in, in, in 15 years. So, so that's the type of danger that, that, that you could, uh, or, or, or you, yeah. Uh, yeah, so sort of, sort of risks that you're running by looking at these cross-sectional stories. So, so, so when, you know, to motivate why we look at this in, in the Nordic countries is that we have the full longitudinal data where we could follow individuals over a long time. So um, let me get to then the, the Nordic countries. Uh, and, and the first thing a refugee immigrant will, will meet in Norway is what's called the introduction program. And it's the same thing in Sweden, same thing in Finland, Denmark, uh, Germany, Netherlands as well. Uh, various, various degrees. So, so the introduction program in Norway is one where you're offered a, a stipend. It's, it's pretty sizable. It's about 200,000 Norwegian kroners. And I was told that I should multiply by two and a half. Is that right? So we're talking 500,000 uh, Czech kroners a year uh, to go to school pretty much. And, 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 and typically they'll be in these kinds of classroom type settings where they are taught intensively uh, language. That's, that's the most important thing. But also a lot about civics and, 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 and the workings of, of the country. Uh, you're in that program for, for two years, can be extended to three. You could be out if you have, so, so very often you find that the, the women are, are out for periods because of, of, of childbirth, uh, and then in and out like that. So, 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 so typically it's, it's, a, it's a process that lasts for a while. Um, then there's, there's a great emphasis of those programs of, of placing uh, the graduates in a job. This is very important for, for anyone who runs one of these. So, so the, these, these programs are like totally decentralized. So it's up to the different municipalities to run these however they want to. Turns out about half of the municipalities said, we don't want to do it, so we want the government or the federal government to come in and do it for us, which is, which is good, right? But, but, but there's, there's, there's a lot of variation in the content of these programs, but, but common to them all is that they really want to, to, to place their graduates in a job. So, so the question sort of ad hoc here is that, that um, or a priori is that um, if, if you're placed in the job, then, then there's other things follow as a, as a result. Uh, for example, entitlement to, to a lot of social insurance programs, to, to benefits, welfare benefits. And, and it's, so it's not obvious that the integration process in a typical uh, developed welfare state 
will, will look like what we saw in these previous slides. So, so that's what, what I, I, I want to get to uh, now. So, so typically when we, we do this, and this is based on work that I do with a couple of colleagues, um, we stack together all these individual data. So we, we, very often we end up with, with something like here, like 45 to 50 million observations. And we sort of let's follow individuals over, over their life course and, and see how they do in the network. So typically the study here, we, we look at those who are like relatively young adults at the time of arrival. And then we see how, how do they do after two years, after three years, four years, 20 years. Um, and uh, just to, yeah, let me, let me show you one thing. Uh, to make things easy, uh, let's think of, of an outcome that, that says, are you, not are you employed, but what's your main source of, of income? Is it from work? That's what I'm gonna call employment. Or is it from social insurance or from welfare transfers? That's what I'm gonna call social insurance. So those are two simple, simple variables that show do most of my income come from one of these two sources? And, and as you could see from, from this descriptive picture over here, for natives, you'll find that the majority receive their main income from, from work, uh, but there's a sizable group that, that receive more from, from social insurance. Uh, almost 20% of women, 15% of men. For the refugee population, uh, you'll see those orange fields being, being a, lot, uh, a lot larger. Uh, so for, for men, you'll have less than 60% uh, having work as the main source of income. Uh, for women, we're talking 45% uh, in, in these cross-sectional data. But that uh, does not stay constant over time, and that was the old thing about uh, refugee integration in the labor market. If you look at those employment rates, or this, this, whether or not the main source of income is work, uh, and how that evolves with time, and again, this is still a cross-sectional picture, you'll see that for the refugee population, for men, you have very low employment rates soon after arrival, rising very, very rapidly, striking very rapidly, and, and then stalling, that process, and then perhaps declining, at least it looks so in that picture. But um, to study this thing properly, we need to account for all sorts of, of heterogeneity in these populations, uh, as we, I, I talked about earlier. Uh, we do that with, with a framework that I'm not gonna get into, but I'll show you the results in the picture. And, and this is a similar picture to what we saw earlier for the European uh, labor markets. Uh, and this shows that the assimilation or integration process of refugee males is, is amazingly rapid. So, so we're starting out soon after arrival with, with a 50 percentage point employment differential, similar to what we saw uh, in the European Labor Force Survey. But look how fast this, that, that, that is growing. So after five years, that differential has shrunk to now where it's 18%, or it's 18 percentage points. But then, and this is sort of the, the worry here, the concern, then, then it seems like it goes into reverse. So the process of labor market integration, which is really, really fast, stalls and goes into reverse. The differentials relative to similarly aged and similarly educated uh, native workers start widening, start, start increasing. And that has been a, a topic of of uh, a lot of work that we've done. Uh, let me, before I get to that, I'll, I'll just point out, oh, this didn't look good, did it? Uh, it, it? If you go to Denmark, a neighboring country, you'll find something very similar. But if you go to Sweden, which is also a neighboring country, you won't find the same picture. So, so it's hard to spot the refugees in here, but we have the refugees, the male refugees and the female refugees, they're the, the, the very sort of uh, small dots. And you could tell that employment rates just keep growing and growing. And relative to, to what they call labor migrants, I wouldn't call these labor migrants. If the employment rates are 70% to begin with, they could be labor migrants, can they? <laughs> By definition, a labor migrant is someone who works in year one, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> so, so, but at any rate, uh, the evidence from Sweden uh, points 
slightly in a different direction. So, so, so less heterogeneity across, across time. So the one thing that, that Denmark shares with Norway, and this is this very emphasis of, of the introduction program of, of getting, placing the graduates in a job. And, and that is, oh yeah, for, before I get there, uh, let me get to, so, so when we have the main source of income being employment or being welfare, uh, and we see a decline in, in employment over, over the life cycle, is that mirrored by, by an increase in, in welfare uh, uptake? And the, the answer is, is yes. So, so, so the really good thing about this picture over here is that uh, the, the rate at which refugees, and the blue lines there are the refugees, the rate at which refugees uh, have uh, benefits, welfare benefits as their main source of income, declines very, very rapidly for about five years, and then they start rising at, at maybe a worrisome rate, because it's one percentage point per year of residents faster than the native population. And this is what we've been, uh, oh no, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the second time I, I, uh, I, I, as I was preparing this thing, I kept adding more slides <laughs> and then I forget. So, so, you know, having seen that picture on, on, on the welfare uh, assimilation, you may ask what sort of welfare is it that they're collecting? What sort of welfare program is it that they're uh, enrolled in? Uh, and, and what I've done here is I've, I've grouped the Norwegian welfare system into five major programs, uh, spanning the introduction program, which we already talked about, social assistance, which is like the, 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 the absolute sort of last resort type of, of, of cash benefits that you get by going to, to the social assistant office, um, uh, unemployment insurance, which is a, a, uh, something that you get if you've been working. So this is something that, that could be a part of that integration process. Of course, you work for a year, you, you're eligible for unemployment insurance if you lose your job. Uh, disability insurance, turns out it's gonna be the, the big one over here. And disability insurance, although you, you have to have a doctor say that your, your, your work capacity is reduced by 50% due to some health issue, it turns out the main, main uh, diagnosis here is, is back pain. So, so it's, it's, it's one where, where it's commonly uh, recognized as being sort of a, a, a way of, of retiring early from the, from the labor market. Uh, and then we have some other programs as well. And, and here I have a, one of these carpet uh, plots that uh, are nice and colorful, right? I, I just want you to recognize it. So this is conditional on having uh, welfare benefits be the main source of income. And you see from, for natives, it's, it's the orange, it's the disability insurance that is the, the big, the really big program, right? And, and what's kind of interesting from, from this chart is to see that, that all these other groups, refugees over here, uh, even, even those from the old EU or the new EU, they're all sort of assimilating into, oops, assimilating into the native rate of, of using the, the disability insurance program as their main, main source of income. Not the main source of income, but conditional on, on being in that category. Then, to my story. Uh, so, so uh, the great news here, rapidly rising integration rates into the labor market. The slight bit of reason for concern is that the process seems to go into reverse. So, so there is something here saying that, that, that the potential, so if you go to say 10 or 20 years after arrival, the potential for, for immigrant or refugee immigrant employment is, is more than what we see in the data. So, so we've been spending a lot of time on worrying, thinking about what, what is it that's causing this stuff. And, and, and we, we found that there's, there's like an interplay between the labor market and the welfare system. So, so to put it kind of brutal, uh, describe it in a brutal way, uh, the, the, the jobs that the immigrants uh, are placed in following the introduction program, they're not good jobs. They're jobs that, that, that have a very high propensity to disappear in, soon into the future. And, and by that time, they have qualified for 
the generous welfare uh, programs. And, and when you, if the job search process is difficult and there's a, a generous welfare payment sitting there as an alternative, then, then that's, that sort of what explains a lot of, of that picture. Um, so there's a, a paper here of job loss where, where we look at, or we're looking at, at major, so mass layoffs in firms, and, and then we're, we're linking this to data from, from, uh, from uh, bank court, or, or, or our bankruptcy proceedings in the courts. Uh, and we're finding that, that a, job, a mass layoff that's falling by a bankruptcy, this is something that, that refugee immigrants are twice as likely to experience compared to a native worker. And once they experience that adverse event, the consequences on future employment and future earnings are about twice as detrimental as what we find for, for natives. So, so just that, that thing of holding a job that, that's insecure in the sense that it's very likely to disappear uh, accounts for about half of that relative decline in economic status over the years between five and, and, and 15 years after arrival. Um, we've been looking at, at this thing about uh, social insurance generosity and whether it could be that if you, if, if, if the welfare system is very generous, are you more likely to be there or are you more likely to not be there in a sense? This is a very difficult thing to study because, because we know that, that those who, who, who receive benefits, it's, it's, a select, it's a select group, right? So, so we need some, some like experimental, uh, quasi-experimental uh, type setup what, what we have been using in one study is, is a, a major reform of the benefit formula, so the way they computed benefits, was reformed uh, a lot, or very substantially back in 2002, in one of the major programs in Norway, the, the temporary disability insurance program. So, so, so with that uh, reform of the benefit formula, we observe individuals, or what we can tell is, is is what individuals would have received under the old rules, what they receive under the new rules, and, and we study, it's like a different diff type setup. We study how, how do they, those who, who receive the new benefits of acts that's different from the old population. So, so with that, that revamping of the, of the benefit scheme, there were a lot of winners and, and some, some, some losers. Uh, and, and what we find in here is that the first thing we observe is that those who receive higher benefits, they postpone the transition out of the welfare program. So they stay longer on the program. This is true for men, for women, for immigrants and natives. Uh, in particular, it's the transition to employment that's delayed. It's, it's cozier to be on the program, to put it, put it brutally. Um, and, and with that delay, we have future earnings uh, so I have a picture here, I'm gonna show you just, just really quickly what, what sort of numbers we're talking about. So here we're, we're looking at the response in a sense, or the consequence of a one euro increase in benefits on future labor earnings. So if you look at native men, for instance, we find that one euro higher benefits this year leads to 20 cents lower earnings, two years and three years, no, one year and two year after they enter the program. For immigrant men, it's a much larger number. So over here, it doesn't look like the, the differences are all that significant, but once you start sort of grouping these together, they're, they're, they're immensely significant, right? Uh, so here we have a, a 40 cent uh, reduction in earnings. That difference is significant. What does it come from? Well, that's another thing that we're, we're studying in here. We're finding that this has to do with characteristics of these individuals. And in particular, that the immigrant men are in a position where their returns to staying in the labor market in terms of earnings potential is much lower on average than that of native men. So if we compare native men and immigrant men with similar earnings prospects, they're not all that different or at least we reduce the difference quite a bit. 
So we could, in a sense, explain a lot of this difference that we observe, observe in the data. And it has to do with the kinds of, 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 of hurdles, the kinds of, of barriers that immigrants or refugee immigrants need in the labor market. Another thing that's, that's kind of curious about this, this exercise is that we find that if you raise the benefits of those on the program, you'll find that their spouses, those who are married or in a partnered relationship, they also respond. And that's particularly true in the immigrant population. So if you raise the benefits paid to immigrant women, we find that their husbands withdraw from the labor market at a relatively high rate. So it's like a double whammy, right? But, but we could track everything down to this that there is, or not everything, we could track a lot, <laughs> down to the fact that there is this difference in, in responses by, by statute. I was gonna ask how am I doing time-wise? I'm, um, oh, okay, 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 all right. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna leave the labor market quite yet. I'll, I'll talk about another thing that you see a lot, but from the, from the Scandinavian countries. Is, is this thing about asking, does location matter? And location is another, another type of, of, of exercise or problem that we, we don't really want to address because we know there's a lot of sorting. And, and from, from my previous work, especially in the US, we know that if, if there's one thing that immigrants are really good at, it's, it's locating themselves in places where there are job opportunities, right? They, very rarely do you see immigrants move to areas where there are absolutely no uh, labor market or job opportunities unless they're forced to. And, and that's the thing about these dispersal policies that, that refugees face, because refugees, they are dispersed out to the municipalities in a way that they cannot totally control themselves. So you're told that you have to live in a certain community. And, and, and a lot of studies uh, have used this, or the quasi-experimental design that comes out of this uh, dispersal policy to study how does that placement in a good location relative to a bad location affect their future labor market outcomes. If I were to do that in innovation data, so I take all these refugees that have arrived between 1990 and, and year 2015, no, 2012, and, and, and see how do they do five years later? Or actually, it's, it's four to six, but if, say, think five years later. And does that have anything to do with where they were placed after I control for, or, or I take account of, of individual characteristics, such as their education prior to arrival, or, or the age at arrival, and the year they arrived? And, and then so I'm, I'm just estimating what is the contribution without asking what it is, but I'm just saying what is the contribution of that municipality where they were placed to their future uh, employment. And then I take all those, those municipality effects and I group them and then I sort them and then I, I show you a picture over here where I group them into to cells of equal size, so five percentiles each of, of, of that distribution. And I find that, that there's a huge difference between being placed in a very good municipality, in a sense, and a bad municipality. If we look at sort of the, the 20th percentile of that, that distribution compared to, say, the 80th percentile, we're talking about employment differentials of 15 percentage points. And 15 percentage points, that's like half of that gap that I, that I was screaming about uh, 10 minutes ago. So, so in other words, I'm saying that half of that gap could have been erased if those refugees were placed in the good municipalities and not in the, the municipalities that have some sort of characteristics that make them bad for, for refugee employment. And what are those characteristics? Well, they're, they're local labor demand, no question. We're also finding that that refugee migrants are affected by competition from other migrant groups. And in particular, I didn't, I didn't spend much time on, on labor migrants from the new EU countries, but that's, that's so, 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 so. Polish construction workers hurt 
the assimilation process of refugee migrants. Competition in labor market, it's there. Uh, and after what I said earlier, I, I, so I haven't done any work on this, but, but some, some colleagues have, variation in, in the content of this introduction program. You could also explain some of those differences that we see. Then I want to move to politics, and I'll spend a couple minutes on, on politics. Uh, so political integration, so this is something that, that where there's not a lot of, of work being done. Uh, I've done this with, with three colleagues and, and, and co-authors here that are, are enjoyable to work with. You can tell from the date that this is, is, is fresh work. I'm hoping this is the last time I show you a date on this thing, because I think it's, 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 it's close to being published in, the, in, a, good, in a good journal. Um, but here what we're concerned about is it's something very similar to that placement policy that is described, but we're looking uh, to see whether that has anything to do uh, for, for, for political integration. Uh, we don't know a lot about this. What, one thing we do know, though, is that immigrants do not participate uh, as much in politics as the native population. If I were to go to the local elections in 2015, which is a study that, uh, an election I'll talk about in a couple of slides, and look at turnout rates across four groups over here, natives and then three immigrant groups. And, and mind you, these are all people who are, are in the electorate and they're duly informed that they're in the electorate. So, so in, in our way, you're automatically in the electorate for the local elections if you've been in the country for three years. And you will be told so repeatedly. And you will be sent information on, on where the closest uh, polling place is. And typically, it's the neighborhood school. So it's, it's typically not very far away, 500 meters or so. I think it's 200 meters, the median distance to the polling place. So, so, so you know, these are, are individuals who know that they're eligible to vote. And we see that for natives, we have uh, turnout rates of, of 64 five to 70 percent, men and women. But for the, ref this, this, these are the refugee population, I've labeled them differently here, but we're talking about turnout rates of about 40 percent. What's striking over here, this is number down there, eight percent turnout among Polish men who have been lived in Norway for more than three years. What's that? You explain that to me, what is it? Okay. I'm, I'm taking a little bit also as, as showing the difference between been labor and... Uh, so so, so I've, you could ask, does, does this thing have anything to do with how long you've been in the country? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so, so you've seen these kinds of charts before. I'm looking at, at differentials after we adjust for how old you are and we compare them to natives of similar age. And you can see that the refugee population, it, it's pretty stable uh, over years. It doesn't change very much. Uh, with, with time in the country. Uh, the Eastern European or the new EU population over here, um, it's not easy, I've, I've sort of took away some of the cultures. because there's so few in these, these cells over here. Everyone in 2015, most people had been in the country for less than 10 years by, by, sort of by definition. Uh, and, and just as a comparison, I'm also looking at how, how do those who have moved, natives who have moved across municipalities, how do they vote? And, and there you have a great sort of positive selection. Those who, who migrate between municipalities, on the long haul at least, they're, they're positively selected. So they're, they're highly educated people who are, who are more likely to move. Uh, oh, immigrants as candidates in local politics, same election. Uh, you have, if you look at immigrant share of the population, then it was 17.5%, uh, which means that it was 144 of the electorate, because those who have been in the, in the country for less than three years do not count. Uh, but of candidates, we're down to about 3.8%. So you're much less likely to, to run for office if you're an immigrant. So, so, so immigrant uh, political participation rates are low. We in this thing are worrying about do, do sort of what happens to you soon after arrival matter. So, so we're, we're, we're leaning ourselves on two strands of the literature. Uh, one that shows that for refugee immigrants, what happens those first few years is important. That, that has sort of lingering, lingering uh, consequences. Uh, and the other is this resettlement location 
that I talked about for a little bit ago, where we use the dispersal policy as, a, as an experimental design. So what we do here is we look at resettlement refugees coming to Norway through the uh, UN High Commissioner or Refugees Program. Uh, so, so what's nice about this group is that they move directly into, so they, they, they know very little about, about Norway, or they know something about Norway, but they, they do not influence where they're gonna go. Uh, and they move directly from Varroa into a neighborhood. And it's that neighborhood that we're gonna study over here. Uh, just to remind you the difference between asylum uh, refugees and the replacement refugees. Uh, so this was all in green in some earlier charts, but you could see it, for instance, in, in 2016, which was a, a, a year where there were a lot of refugee immigrants arriving in Norway, the, the majority are asylum uh, refugees. Uh, so, but it's the green bars that we, we will study over here. So, so we can look at how they end up in different neighborhoods. Let me show you a little picture of that. Uh, here, I've, I've, I've taken all the neighborhoods in Norway. There's about 14,000 of them in this data. The, the median size is about 250, 280 individuals. Um, and then I've grouped these neighborhoods, I'm not gonna use this as sign, but I'm just to illustrate what sort of uh, story we have, into whether or not over the next 20 years they resettle any refugees in their neighborhood. So, so think of this as 300 people, will there be one or more refugees coming into that neighborhood over a 20 year period? Uh, and you could see that the majority of neighborhoods do not resettle any refugees. Uh, and there's about 50-50, where they resettle a moderate amount of refugees in, or a high amount of refugees. I just wanna show the chart for Oslo because it turns out that there's a spot over here that shows my neighborhood, which is a really nice neighborhood, very close to the University of Oslo, filled with academics. 80% have a college degree. They're all like to vote, 80% voted in that election. There's 600 people in that neighborhood, so it's, it's a sizable neighborhood. And, and over that, those 20, no, almost 20 years, uh, there were 11 refugees resettled in the neighborhood. Four of them I know, or, or, or I've talked to. Not about politics, but, but so you can see sort of where I'm, where I'm getting with this story. They resettle with people who care about politics, uh, and some are resettled in neighborhoods where seemingly they, the neighbors do not care so much about politics. And this is what we're wanting to, we want to study. Is, the, is there a difference 20 years down the line as far as how these refugees participate, depending on which neighborhood they resettle in? And guess what? That's what we're finding. Uh, one standard deviation increase in turnout among the neighbors raises the propensity to vote by two to three percent. If we go in and look at this thing within more narrow peer groups, and, and the nice thing over here, if we look at those who were young, teenagers when they arrived, we find this same pattern when we compare siblings. So we take out a family, family fixed effect. So, so I'm at the point where I need to conclude, I think. So I'm just gonna sum up this whole thing by saying that of all these policies, that, that I've been looking at over the years, looking at how or refugee immigrants do in the labor market or as far as political integration, the one policy that really seems to differ is where you are placed when you first arrive. A lot of other policies are important, but this is the one that's, that's like the dominant overriding policy, I think. So thank you.